so much for coming today. Um, my name is Tallery McCray, and I am facilitating this session, which hopefully means I'm doing a lot of listening. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we have uh, HowlRound in the room for webcast capabilities. So um, I want to thank you in advance for your patience with all of the technological feats that we are attempting at the moment. Um, that is going to be very, very important. Um, and also for access purposes, we're going to try to use the microphone as much as possible. So be patient with us as we pass it around. Um, and if you, as we get to the section of our time together where we will have a chance to hear from you and hear any thoughts or questions you might have, be patient with us there too. We're going to try to make sure all of you have the mic. And again, it's uh, for our friends that are joining us um, electronically and also just for access purposes so we all have the same volume. Um, let's go ahead and get started. I wanted to make sure that before we dive into content, we all have a sense of what we're doing here. So we'll start with some introductions. We'll let you know who we are. Um, and we'll also let you know what we're hoping to accomplish in this session. And then before we dive in, we'll just very briefly talk about the language and words that we'll be using in this session. Because like we talked about yesterday at our opening, uh, at our How We Show Up session, words are important. We don't ever want them to get in the way of the work, but I think in this case in particular, it'll be helpful for us to have a common vocabulary as we move forward in this session. So the panel's outside. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work. Okay. All right, we'll have an open door session. Um, that sounds fitting. Um, so who are we? I'm Tallery McRae. I am the facilitator of this session. Um, I am an access, inclusion, and education consultant based in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I have the privilege of working with several theaters and different educational institutions, and one of my very favorite places to call home is the Actors Theater of Louisville, so I'm very um, pleased to be working as part of their staff during their season. And um, like I said before, I'm hopefully here to do a lot of listening and uh, maybe a little bit of tour guiding as well along the way. But I'll have um, Monique and Reagan also introduce themselves. Hi, my name is Monique. My name is Simon is M on the Chi. It's Monique Holt. Why the M on the chin? Is because a lot of times people are looking for me and when they look down they finally see me because I'm short. <laughs> so it helps if I stand when I communicate. But basically I'm an actor, a director, and also a director of artistic sign language for many different theaters. I contract, I'm a freelance contractor. I also work as a consultant with theaters regarding access and accommodation, and I'm happy to share with you later, but that's it for now. Hi everybody, my name is Reagan Linton. I am an actor and uh, currently, oh, here we go with the door. I, there, I'm not going <laughs> to. Uh, and I'm currently the uh, interim artistic director and acting executive director at Family Theater Company in Denver, Colorado. For those of you who don't know what family is, um, the, the name initially stood for the Physically Handicapped Amateur Musical Actors League. We have since done away with that acronym because many of those words we don't choose to use as we're talking about disability and ability. Um, but we still are a theater company that serves actors with disabilities of all kinds, cognitive, intellectual, emotional, and physical, um, doing plays and musicals. So. And I'm also currently a member of the facilitation team for the uh, EDI Institute for TCG. And Monique is part of that. And Monique is also, yes, we are both. We are both part of that facilitation team. Access. Okay. Great. Also, because we 
wanted this session to be incredibly practical, one of the ideas that we had was to do a survey of other professional theater artists that identify as having a disability um, throughout the country. So I put a call out to actors, designers, producers, directors, theater artists in general, and we got several um, participants that shared with us their access needs. Again, their nuts and bolts practical access needs when they're working on a theater project. So periodically throughout our conversation, we'll refer to some of the other needs that we had. It just helped me broaden out in terms of who else was in the room. Do I have any um, participants of that survey that are with us in the room? Claudia's here. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, great. Okay, what are we going to do in this session? It's going to be really practical. You're going to leave with lots of ideas. We are going to be talking about best practices um, at the theater company where Reagan works. We're going to be talking to Monique about best practices in the theaters that she consults with. And also, we're going to be checking in with them about the individual accommodations that they have uh, negotiated as performers. And we're also, like I just said, going to check in with the other people that participated um, via the survey as well and we'll have some time at the end for questions. How are we gonna talk about access? And this is really important. When you're thinking about taking this back to your home theater, many, many, many theaters say, we don't even know how to get the conversation started. So let me give you two words. The first word is accessible. If you are jumping into access for the first time, you can feel really empowered at your theater to talk about the environments that you support as being accessible. That's the physical environment, the communication environment, the information environment, and the social environment. For me, I love the word accessible because everyone can contribute to an accessible space and because as a provider of an accessible environment, you don't have to know anything about an individual's impairment, diagnosis, personal history. You just have to ask them what they need. And when you ask them what they need to create an accessible environment, you're going to ask them about a reasonable accommodation. So the word accommodation is, a, a, again, a really big support there. We throw the word reasonable in front of it, or at least I do, because that is actually legal support for you. That helps you. If you let somebody know that you are providing a reasonable accommodation for an artist with a disability, there is some legal and structural support for you to do so because it's part of, it's part of your legal obligation and you're also navigating it creatively. But that legal support can be really helpful. And if you take nothing else away from this session, I want you to feel not, um, I want you to feel really confident about embracing that legal support and how it can help you in making your spaces more accessible. Um, the last thing I want to say is that there's lots of different ways that you can talk about the disability community. You can talk about people of all abilities, you can talk about disabled individuals, you can talk about individuals with disabilities, whether or not you put the disability before the word or after the word, just say it. And that's just something we're going to embrace and we're going to help support you in that. And if you need any support with that, if that's new for you, um, we're, here, we're really here to help you do that and celebrate that and just get used to rolling those words around in your mouth. Panels, before we go on from language, is there anything else you want to add? Yeah. It's really interesting for us as a deaf community. We don't use the word hearing impaired. Hearing impaired indicates that our ears are broken. They never work in the first place. That's something to consider. We call ourselves Big D Deaf, capital D Deaf, as a group. And then those that speak in sign, they prefer, prefer to be called hard of hearing, which is fine. So I just want to let you know and share some vocabulary around that topic. Okay, great. As we're about to dive into some of the specifics, um, we thought there were a few things to keep in mind, a few trends that you might see um, as, as we start to tell stories about theaters and people that have made accommodations, you might find that things are kind of falling into a couple categories. So I wanted to name that ahead of time so you can start doing that work and, and hopefully categorizing things for yourself. Um, one, of the thing, one of the themes that we find in best practices in inclusion 
and in access is that theaters are planning ahead. You, you have to kind of start that work early and often and keep those conversations going. Um, it's really easy to make accommodations if you plan ahead. It's really hard if you're trying to do that and make a play at the same time. So um, we will talk about that. Um, and always, always, always in having your conversation, make sure that you ask those questions to the individuals that you're working with rather than assuming what accommodations they might need. They're right there as your resources. Again, I want you to feel empowered as the experts on your space and your environment and the individuals that you're working with are the experts on themselves. So that brings two people with great expertise in a really fun and exciting and creative space if you can think about it like that. Um, so don't make, don't give yourself the extra burden of feeling like you have to be the expert on them and they won't make sure that they're the expert on your face because they won't be. Um, so plan ahead. Also communication, right, always, um, always and often. In planning the session, I thought it was so much fun to talk to Reagan. We're like, yeah, that didn't work, but we just kept talking about it. <laughs> yeah, that didn't work, but we tried something else. Oh yeah, that didn't work, but we tried it again. Um, and I, I know for those of us that work in accessibility, that's kind of a common thing. Uh, yeah, so keep communicating, always. Also, this one, it's amazing how far this will go. Be really open and honest. Um, put on your best customer service faces in terms of being welcoming, and then just be flexible with how it goes. If you've got a space that's not 100% ADA compliant, be super honest about that. If we all waited for our spaces to be perfect, nobody would do any of this. Which brings me to my last point, which I really like, which is aim for possible and not perfect. Right? You, you, wanna, you wanna have the project happen. You wanna get it started. And if you wait for your building to be 100% like accessible, which I get suspicious of, I don't think it exists. If you wait for your staff to feel 100% comfortable and well-trained, if you wait for all of those things to line up, the project isn't gonna happen. The best stories of access I know are when people go, oh, oops, ooh, let's try again, oops, let's try again. So that we're going to help each other in this space embrace the oops and talking about how to make things possible rather than perfect. Okay. Okay, so how do you find performers with disabilities? And I have this in a handout for you, but I wanted to organize it for you first because these three... Um, uh, resources are the big ones, right? There's an online database with Actors Access, um, which at first glance tends to have a lot of West Coast um, gigs on there, but there's also resources in terms of looking for people in other geographic locations too. Um, the Alliance for Inclusion in the Arts is based in New York City, so if you're looking for something that's more East Coast, they can help you there. Um, and then the diversity department um, with SAG after is actually really great. And even if you're a theater and you're not working with SAG um, specifically, they can point you to other resources and help you know um, how to find the community that you're looking for. And again, I have this for you in a lovely handout. I also have for you in a handout a small handful of agencies and specific casting agents that represent um, performers with disabilities, so that's super helpful. I didn't put that on the slide just to save space, but we've got that for you in a handout. The other thing I think is really helpful to know is that there are groups that um, represent different um, groups within the disability community. So if you're doing a play where you're looking specifically for a performer with autism or an amputee or someone with Down syndrome, those kinds of things, those groups exist too, and you can reach out. Now, um, it's not always a one-step process. They might give you a couple of referrals to do it, but from the casting directors and directors that I've talked to, if you're persistent with it, there are certainly performers are out there. Um, I also uh, made sure that we've got Deaf West Theater and Family Theater on there. Um, and I wanted, to, as we transition to hearing from Monique and Reagan about their experience, I wonder if they would talk just a little bit as performers about that process of even just hearing about auditions and what that's like, and then we can jump into the actual audition process. So, um, oh, sorry, hang, hang, hold on for that thought for one second. So once you decide to cast a uh, performer with a disability, what, what words do you use? How do you find the language to do it? So I pulled Family Theater's latest audition notice, right? And Family Theater, specifically, you need to have a disability to be part of family. So that was included. Uh, the word disability was all over their um, uh, notice. But also the last line of this uh, is important to me. Well, 
it's really all kind of cool, I think. Consideration, strong mogul, musical, vocal, and acting skills, including the ability to interpret music through a language like ASL. That's going to tell a performer a lot about what family's open to. And then also auditions are by appointment only and arranged by phone. Please specify any disability accommodations that you might need. Um, I'm in the process of working with a couple different theaters on tweaking their um, audition language. So I have kind of an internal draft that I've done, right? So whatever theater uh, encourages performers with disabilities to audition and will provide reasonable accommodations to individuals who request them in advance. And this is my personal preference. I think if you can say in your audition notice or list an example of the accommodations that you're willing to provide, that communicates a lot to the performers you're working with. They go, oh, they didn't just throw that on the end of their diversity statement. They, they thought about this and they are ready to provide an accommodation if I ask for it. Which really helps a performer at ease and I want um, Reagan and Monique to talk about this because in the audition process we're already dealing with a power dynamic and asking a performer to ask for something extra can sometimes be really tricky. So the more you can do as an organization to put them at ease that you are, you've thought about it in advance, that you are welcoming to this idea, the better that audition's gonna be. And at that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ray, oh, um, I'm actually, I am, we're gonna go out of order. I'm gonna turn it over to Reagan and Monique to talk a little bit about uh, what the audition process is like for them. Uh, well, first, I'd just like to jump back to that the one slide that's about the resources and particularly about utilizing community groups, whether it be a theater company or whether it's another organization that is disability specific. Um, and, it, and it all wraps up in one because while while these are great, great resources um, and, and just know there are also a lot more than what we have listed up here. Um, still, just keep in mind that you, you don't want to put the onus on these groups to figure out your casting need for you. Um, now, as, as artistic director of family, I often get calls to say, hey, we're looking for an actor who uses a wheelchair, and we need him you know, in three weeks, and we, you know, can you put the audition notice out for us to your, your community? And I'm happy to do that, but, um, but I think it just, it, it also puts you know, the burden of that work onto these groups to do your work for you. So just keep that in mind that um, you know you still want to you still want to connect to a multitude of groups, and then you're the one who follows up on those recommendations um, rather than having an artistic director send the email themselves. <laughs> um, so that's just one thing I want to I wanted to mention. Um, and then in terms of moving on to well, did you have anything about resources, Monique? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're doing great. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I'll just also say, you know, the, the landscape of disability theater in America is still very, um, it, it, the, the cohesiveness is still developing. There are multiple initiatives right now that are occurring in different cities. There are convenings of people who work in theater and disability that are trying to come together and trying to find a way to dialogue, trying to establish like a, a, um, a website that would have like all different disability theater resources in all different cities. So just know that is something that the community itself is really working towards. Um, but you know we're just we're very scattered. Um, so hopefully we'll have more resources for you guys in that regard coming up in the next couple of years. Um, but yeah, in terms of auditioning all this language, I guess the biggest biggest thing that I want to put out there is this idea of if you include it, kind of if the if you build it, they will come mentality, or if you express it, they will feel more apt to come. Um, you know, when I when I do not see anything, any sort of inclusion statement about disability, or if I see an inclusion statement but it doesn't include disability, um, that's that's often ex an experience that I've had as an artist. Uh, you know, talking about EDI, but then feeling like disability is the one thing that's left out um, because people think that disability means you actually can't do the job. Um, so I, when I do see it expressed that disability is something, is a piece of diversity that a theater company is looking for, then I'm on top of it. Um, and, I, and I will go back to that theater again and again, um, as opposed to if I never see it included you know, in audition breakdowns, things like that. Um, so that's just one thing that I want to reemphasize. And then, Monique, do you want to say anything before we move on? 
if you have more, keep going. Otherwise, I'll say something. <laughs> well, I guess, do you want us yeah. to move on to, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in terms of how I find out about auditions, uh, you know, now social media does play a huge role. Uh, there is a pipeline of artists with disabilities across the country, and often we are looking out for each other. And so, you know, I have friends in New York, including at Inclusion in the Arts, which is the organization that was mentioned. Um, but also individual artists. So it, there's very much a, hey, you know this person who has an amputation, hey, you know this person who uses a wheelchair. Um, so that's often how things are communicated. I will mention one one thing, though. Recently, the, the most recent production of Glass Menagerie that's on Broadway, they, they were very intentional about putting out um, a notice saying, hey, we're looking for a Laura that, use, that has some sort of disability. And they sent it everywhere. I'm sure many of you in this room probably probably got that, that audition notice. And I was really impressed at where I was getting it. I was getting it coming from Montana. I was getting it coming from Oregon. I was getting it coming from Colorado. Um, so it was clear that they had done their work in terms of sending it out as far and wide as they possibly could to make sure that they were going to get as many um, options as possible. Um, but in terms of other auditions, you know, I'm an equity actor, so I will often go to the actor's equity site. And again, that's where if I see something expressed in the breakdown that says this is an inclusive, or you know, these auditions are looking for actors with disabilities, I will apply. If I don't see that, um, then it seems like that value is not expressed in that organization, and I often won't be likely to apply unless it's a project that I can kind of conceive of, or a director, or you know, somebody that I know that's working on the project. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the main thing is we find auditions the same way everybody finds auditions, but we often won't feel encouraged to submit if there's not something explicit that relates to our disability identity. Something I've been thinking about as an actor, often I'll look in the newspaper or articles or through word of mouth and they'll say, oh, they have a role for a deaf person. They're looking for this position to be filled. And they provide a sign language interpreter. Oftentimes it'll say that with SAG and equity. However, for actors on stage or for the deaf, they'll, they'll provide it. But again, don't assume. Sometimes I'll arrive and I'll be like, where's the interpreter? So sometimes we have to be very direct and say, I need a sign language interpreter. And they're like, oh, okay, we weren't prepared. Yes, we want to have a deaf person, but how do I even get an interpreter? And so we've got everything backwards. It's like, okay, that's fine, no problem. And then I educate, I take the opportunity to educate. But after the second or third time, there's no excuse. So I'd like to make a suggestion about contacting sign language interpreters in your area, contacting deaf clubs in your area, deaf service organizations. These are all good resources that you can contact in your area. Just Google it, you'll find them. And they'll be able to provide you with good lists, good agency lists for providing interpreters, and you'll be able to use that to your benefit, to the benefit of your organization. Something else to think about again is you've got the network at your fingertips. Remember back then, what we did back then when we couldn't just type something in and get all the information we needed? And sometimes, we, you know, it's through word of mouth. We network and we talk to each other. And the reason we do that is because we create cohesiveness. We're together. And we want deaf roles given to deaf actors. And that's why we support each other. But sometimes we think, oh, I'm the best deaf actor. And that can be another issue where we try to really hoard that position or hoard that um, that role. That can be a big issue. I don't know about in the disability community, but um, it's an opportunity for us to become like, I need the work, or I need that, and we become very um, hoarding about it. But we need to make those roles available and support each other to get those roles as well. And that's the attitude that we need to foster and then look at through different lenses so that we can really identify and recognize that problem within our community. And then from a casting perspective, it means that we have to be prepared. Like, how do we provide accessibility, access to accessibility, by including them in the first place? Before we even begin to send out the audition, 
Maybe we contact a person with a, who's in a wheelchair now. We're like, we know this person. Okay, let's reach out to them. Or we, you know, we want to look for a person with a disability and have a conversation. So like, how do I start this process? And maybe we dialogue with the person that we know. We can start this conversation one-on-one. -on -one. We can brainstorm together. We can talk about agencies and organizations that you can contact. And they might have a list of people within the deaf community or the disability community or organizations that you can contact. So you can get that information from doing our homework. And now 50% of the work is done. And then you can go on and uh, put out those uh, casting notices and do, and they can do the work. And that's it. You've got a leg up, so use it. You know, word of mouth, use it. We've all got tongues, let's use them. Okay, so, and sometimes we really have to just go out to the community and say, I'm looking for this or I'm looking for that. Please spread the word. And people can then perpetuate that on social media through Facebook and other forms of social media. So please share this and it will get the word out there. And then you'll have plenty of people in your pipeline that you can select. You'll have choice and not just say, oh, uh, we got one person that came to our audition, but they don't have any acting skill. Uh, what are we going to do? Whose fault is that? Ours. So that's from the audition piece of it. Thanks. I am going to be really aware that we've got neighbors in the next room over who've asked us to be a little careful with our volume, so I'm going to use soothing tones. <laughs> um, great. So we talked a little bit about auditions, and I want to jump into the nuts and bolts specifically about auditions and callbacks. We're going to get to this in just a minute with um, some of the survey responses that we got, but I want to give Reagan and Monique a chance to talk about the nuts and bolts of when you book an audition, what do you need to make sure is in place? Monique talked a little bit about, oh, thanks for having a sign language interpreter. I hope they're going to be there. So um, we talk a little bit more about what's your routine to make sure that your audition is accessible, and then we'll go on from there. Thanks, Jess. <clears throat> Really, auditions are not not done for deaf roles often. I see you know, people are willing to provide interpreters. I always ask that, and they often go, oh, sure, I'm happy to have you come, but we don't have that in our budget for an interpreter. So I show up, or they have a monologue typed out for me, and I know the play, and I do it, but often um, they might provide there's organizations that are profit and not for profit, and that makes a big difference. Um, money is often a factor. But again, people with disabilities always say, we always say thank you. <laughs> you know, we want to be an ally. You know, we have to do our part as well. You know, it's the give and take between us and the organizations. You know, <laughs> thanks for being equitable. You know, we can't, and, you know, we, we can't, we're entitled to that. We need to communicate our needs. They can't read our minds, the organization. We need to tell them what we need. And sometimes we feel, oh, well, I'm not really deaf, I'm hard of hearing, I can speak for myself, but, you know, but that causes a problem. Just tell them, I need an interpreter. And when you get there, you know, you know, it would be nice to know that that's available and ready for you when you get there. It lessens the stress on both sides. Yeah, I think for me, um, one of the biggest things is flexibility in terms of the audition experience. Number one, timing. Uh, so when I roll into a room, often I feel like I'm not just trying to prove that I can do the role, I'm trying to also prove that I deserve to live as a human being. <laughs> uh, and so that, that takes extra time. And then in terms of just the logistics, you know, if you have a three or four minute time slot for your audition, and you want to do a good job on your monologue, um, but you also, you know, you maybe need to communicate actively and offer up information about, you know, for me specifically, can I get out of my wheelchair? Is that something that's available to me in a play? Number one, that's not something that you're technically allowed to ask as a director, so that's information that I have to be willing and ready to offer up and have that kind of packaged of like, well, how am I gonna, how am I gonna tell this director what I can do? 
but then I also have to build that into my audition time, um, which cuts back on the actual audition. So I think having a little bit more time to have those conversations with individuals as human beings and, and um, say, you know, is there anything else you'd like to tell us about your performance style, about your, uh, you know, about your body, about, you know, uh, inviting that, that conversation to take place. Um, and then just realizing that that's a lot to be asking somebody, you know, where other actors get stymied and, and tripped up just by how they open the door and go into the room. Well, sometimes I've gone in and there are two steps up to the stage. And so then I've got to ask the director like to help bump me up to the stage. And like, so there's just a lot of other stuff that's at play. Um, and so the more you can, you know, not only know your environment so that you know what to tell people, that's that social stories idea of being able to communicate, okay, well, here's what you're going to find when you get into the room. Um, and not just making the assumption that if you have two steps up to a stage, that everybody's going to be able to do that. Um, so those are, it's just the little details that complicate the audition experience. Um, and I think the more flexible and the more communicative you can be about that experience, the better. I'm trying to think if there was anything else. Yeah. Anything oh. different for callbacks than auditions? Yeah, I, I think the other thing, I'll, I'll speak to um, different, uh, different disabilities also. One thing that I found a lot working at family is if you're dealing with somebody who has a visual impairment or somebody who has dyslexia or somebody, you know, the, the script experience can be so complicated for some people. And you might have a great performer who, once they've had time to prepare, can blow your socks off. But if you're putting them in a situation where you don't provide the script with enough time for preparation, um, then you're not gonna get the product that they can bring. So I think that's another really important thing to think about, just adding a few minutes on for their preparation for cold readings, um, or providing the, the, the script in advance so that they can prepare a little bit. Um, and, and making sure that people know that that's available, because again, often there's this, this fear that if you make an accommodation that will cut you out of the opportunity to get the job. If you email the casting director and say, hey, can I get the script beforehand because I have dyslexia and I want to be able to look at it early, that they'll say, no, you're asking for, you know, then we can't consider you, you know, that, so making, making it um, obvious that those accommodations are available is really helpful and will, will allow people to ask and then to do their best work. So hold the mic, Reagan, because okay. you did a great segue there into how family theater operates because the entire ensemble has different disabilities and different needs. And we've got a handout for you about family theater's accommodations too, so we have all this in handout form. But just for time, I wanted to have Reagan talk about a couple of different accommodations for auditions and callbacks that you might not be familiar with. Um, Monique talked about ASL interpreters. The idea of a social story walking someone through what their experience would be like. We do a lot for our audiences these days, but you can also do that for your performers. But um, Reagan, can you talk a little bit more about the form completion and audition prep at Family? Yes, so form completion. So again, this is one of those details that for some people is very simple, for others not so much. So we have volunteers on hand who are just there to help somebody fill out their audition information form. Um, our form also includes more information about you know, what, what kind of accommodations would you need during the, the rehearsal process. Um, but we have people on hand who can help with that. We also can send the form ahead of time electronically and then be able to you know, have them print it out and bring it or, you know. So again, thinking of those tiny little details that for many of the normative population don't stop them up, but when you're stressed out about the audition and then you have to think about filling out a form and you don't know how to read it, that can be a very stressful situ uh, situation. Um, and then in terms of audition prep and like uh, acoustic checking, it's again just the idea of knowing what the environment is that you're coming into. Particularly for a lot of performers with disabilities who haven't had professional experiences, don't know what to expect in those situations. Um, we try to do free, uh, free audition workshops before our auditions because our auditions are open to the entire community, anybody who has a disability. So we offer free audition workshops so that they can understand the experience of okay you're gonna enter the room you're gonna you know there are gonna be people sitting behind a table looking at you they're gonna say okay go ahead start and knowing what you do when they say okay go ahead start which again is a lot of 101 um, for those of us that have been in acting and, and in 
you know, theater programs and things like that. Um, but a lot of these individuals don't have that don't have that experience. And then being able to provide them with the information about the actual environment that they're going into um, is really really helpful. Uh, and then do you want me just to talk about yeah. readers really quick? So readers are another thing. This is another idea of what's possible and not perfect. Um, we have visually impaired actors who, you know, because of the situation, we may have to give them a cold reading on the day of that they're just not prepared to, to memorize, you know, in two or three minutes. We have volunteers, often fellow peer actors, who will be there to go through the script with the cold reading and then can actually be in the room kind of whispering or cueing the, um, the lines into somebody's ear just you know, very quietly as they're reading the scene um, so, so that they can you know, participate but not have to memorize the scene. Um, so yeah, does that make sense? how that goes. It's kind of like the, <laughs> the, the just like make it happen type of, you know, queuing of, of lines. <laughs> so one of the things I love about family theater is that if you look at this list of accommodations, most of them don't cost any money. Most of them cost time and cost people, but those can be rearranged. So that's really exciting to me. The last thing I want to leave you in terms of auditions and callbacks, and I'll just go without doing the full question, I'll just say that choices are really important in accessibility. So giving an actor a choice between an in-person audition and a video audition is sometimes really huge. And it'll depend on the individual and depend on the disability, which format might be more comfortable for them. But again, if your goal is to see their best work, Give them the choice to feel the most comfortable, right? And these days with video auditions, they're totally possible. So that's just another um, kind of big picture idea I want to put out there. If you give those um, performers a choice, you're going to see their best work coming back. So before we jump on to rehearsals, I just want to show you some of the accommodations that our survey results told us that they needed. Again, let me know. Raise your hand when you see one that costs money. Um, these are really easy to do. I love that Megan Bailey says, you know what, if I'm in a new space, I just need a person there to help orient me and answer questions. And if I get a little anxious, help me know where something is um, so that I feel okay. And the great thing about Megan's survey was she said, I don't need that all the time. I just need that for the first time, you know, the first day, the first time. Um, also, if you can let me know that if there's any schedule changes as far as advance ahead of time, if you can give me directions both verbally and written, which most stage managed teams are really awesome at that anyway, and if I can just have a quiet space, that's what I need. Um, Brianka mentioned something um, at the very end with time priority. She said that her disability is very much affected by times of day, so she does her best work in the middle of the day. And she also shared with me in the survey that that's not something she often asks for when she auditions, and my question is, let's give her the space where she feels comfortable to ask for that. That's not an unreasonable accommodation for her to say, you know what, for me to do my best work, I'm gonna have to be not too early or not too late. So we can do that for her. I think that's really exciting to think about. Okay, ooh, so now, you've cast an actor with a disability. Congratulations! Your process is gonna be so interesting and exciting and creative because you'll have all of that input. It's gonna be great! And it's a little exciting because you're kind of standing on the edge of the cliff and you're not sure what's going to happen, but we're all there to catch you. You're going to jump and fly. It's going to be great. So I had a conversation back in Louisville with our company manager, Doc King, who is amazing and the best at the business in terms of being a company manager. And I said to her, how do you plan for any accommodations that come through? And she said to me, you know what, Tallery, that's my job as the company manager. It doesn't matter if I've got an individual that identifies as having a disability, I spend my whole day making accommodations for performers that come through, whether or not it's technically access or not. She said some of the things that have really helped her is that she knew, she'd been through staff training at Actors Theater, so she knew how to start the conversation. And she was really comfortable saying to those performers, I really want to make sure you have an accessible living experience when you're here in Louisville. Are there any accommodations I can provide for you? And she was comfortable with those words, which is super important when you think about your staff. So she said that was really great in terms of getting started. She also said, you know what? I'm the expert on my space. 
I am the expert on anything that happens at Actors Theatre outside of the rehearsal room. So I can ask specific follow-up questions. Many performers, she said, are so thrilled to have gotten the gig that they're worried that if they ask for anything extra, they're going to be chucked out the door. So she said, it's my job to make them feel comfortable. I say, hey, um, I know that you're coming here and we need to make sure that your space is wheelchair accessible. Let me describe for you the entrance and exit to this apartment. Let me send you a couple digital pictures. Also, can I tell you about how high the bed is off the ground? Can I talk to you through how the shower and the bathroom are laid out? Let's talk through what the kitchen looks like. Do you need anything specific there? And she said once she gets those specifics going, then the performers are like, you know what? I didn't think about it, but I can't reach a freezer that's low down. If you have a freezer that's side by side with a fridge, that would be preferable to me. And she gets a lot more information out of those performers when she sets the tone and when she lets people know that not only is she the expert on her space, but that she's really willing and ready and created the time for herself to ask those questions and follow up in a really meaningful way. That doesn't always mean that she can provide every single accommodation that people ask her for, but they know she's on her team and they know she's gonna try to figure it out in whatever way she can. So I thought that was really helpful. She also said, I'm still learning. And one of the things that really helped her in her work is that um, at Actors Theatre of Louisville, we have an ongoing relationship with the hotel down the street. And they have, um, they have guest rooms for us on a short-term basis, and they also have guest rooms for us on a long-term basis. And she said, they have a really great access person. And so when, I have a, when I'm trying to house a performer with a disability and I don't know what to do, I call the hotel. And we go, oh, you know what? This person would actually do much better at the hotel than here because the hotel already has those accommodations in place. Or vice versa. You know what? The new apartments we have are actually going to be much better for this performer. So we're going to put them there and put somebody else over at the hotel. And that's just the conversation she has with the local resources that are there. And I thought that was a great tip. Um, so that's Dot, and she's cheering for you too. She wants you to really knock this out of the park. So that's in terms of bringing um, uh, performers in from out of town. I wanted to jump to, back to family and think about the ways in which they um, provide specific accommodations in rehearsal, and then we'll hear from Monique and Reagan too as performers and what they need. But again, I've got this for you in a uh, handout. Um, orientations and just orienting the space, um, I'm going to have Reagan talk to us in a minute about what augmented scheduling means and a little bit about what in-room support means. And then also, Reagan, if you could talk just a little bit about bad day support, too, and what that looks like at family. I forgot to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> You're using your voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, oh, really quickly, just one thought about the accommodations that we were talking about before you get a performer into your space. Um, I'm going to use OSF as, an, as a, an example. When I spent my season at OSF, they were so good about asking me all the questions up front that everything was set for me and the rest of the year I felt like I was their, their smallest worry. I had nothing that I needed. Whereas a lot of other actors needed a lot throughout the year. Um, <laughs> I actually felt like, you know, like I made it to every rehearsal, I made it to every performance, I made it because we had had those conversations early and I felt very supported and set up the way I needed to be. Um, so just keep that in mind that I think sometimes it can feel more like more work on the front end, but then that's gonna set you up for success for the rest of the time period. Um, so in terms of these accommodations, uh, the couple that Tallery asked me to talk about, augmented scheduling, time, it, time works differently if you have a disability of many kinds. Um, so we try to just set up a rehearsal schedule that is uh, flexible and also basically makes space for well-being well-being and self-care. What that means for us, we're, we're working with pro uh, professional performers and amateur performers. We have evening rehearsals um, four days a week, four, four weekdays, and then one weekend. So we have two days off uh, for our rehearsal schedule on a regular basis. And it also means it, planning a, a little bit ahead of time. So we try to make rehearsal schedules that look about essentially two weeks out so that people can make their arrangements for transportation, for um, thinking about how it's going to work for them with their daily schedules. Some of us have to get up very early in the morning 
um, for you know attendants that are coming to, to help us with self-care. So if we go until 11 o'clock or midnight, we need to know like, oh, that's gonna be a really late night. Maybe I need to schedule my attendant a little bit later in the morning. Um, In-room support. It, this just means in addition to stage management team, sometimes we get additional volunteers who can just help with, right now we're doing Annie with family and we have 11 kids, which is, a, I mean, on top of all of the, our different disabilities, <laughs> having kids, you know, um, so it just means like, it's really nice to have somebody that can take a kid out of the room to go to the bathroom um, who might need additional help because they use a wheelchair as, and not take away from the stage management team. So just having a little bit of additional in-room support. Um, and then finally, bad day support. Again, disabilities can be very, it can fluctuate a lot. And uh, so this is, this, is, this is the thing that probably costs the least, takes the least amount of resource. All it is is being flexible and supportive and understanding that sometimes people are gonna come in and have had a really shitty day. And I'm talking also about social experiences. We've had actors and family that literally have been assaulted just for being a person with a disability on the street an hour before they come to rehearsal. Um, so when they roll into the room, to the rehearsal room, and they've just been thrown out of their wheelchair, and you know, that that's something you have to be ready to to work with, and to give them some space and support and love. Um, so those are the types of things that we try to um, be ready, and, and always coming back to that place of we're we're a community, we're there to support each other, um, as well as to do the artistic work. I love that idea, Reagan. It's the idea of planning ahead. Again, having a plan B. So that it's not a surprise, it's not an if, but it's a win, and we're ready to go. We just pull, excuse the phrase, we just pull the trigger on plan B and everyone knows what to do so that it's not in the moment we're trying to make this accommodation and make a play at the same time. The accommodation piece is already there. Does that make sense? Okay, great. Um, we're going to go ahead on to uh, Monique to talk just a little bit about uh, rehearsals, tech rehearsals, and performances. I know those can be, uh, those can have some specific access needs. So I just wanted you to talk from your experience as a performer, or even as a director, somebody smart in the room, about what that looks like in your experience. I have a few examples, and I also want to go off topic a little bit, so remind me later. <laughs> I was hired by uh, Millworks Repertory Theater in 1991. And we have a community person, Emily Webb. And that was someone who was experienced working with deaf community, National Theater for Deaf. This was many, many years ago. I have a lot of experience. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, these folks at the time could sign for themselves. The cast was half hearing and half deaf with National Theater. The hearing cast members did not know sign language, and the director was envisioning uh, Martha's Vineyard. I can tell that, Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> Oh, Graham, Martha Graham. I almost said Martha Graham. I'm trying to say Martha's Vineyard. That's different. That's different. <laughs> um, so Martha, the story of Martha's Vineyard is about many deaf people who lived on that island at the time, and all of the people, hearing and deaf, signed. And so this was a concept that they, we were working with, with this production. So we were doing the show Our Town. So how are we going to do that? And we really had to think through that really well, how to do that. The actors and the crew made agreements that we would give up one hour, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m., for sign language learning. And so we were all were on the same equity time. Everyone was involved in that hour in learning. And it was wonderful, and it was beautiful, it was a great experience. All the deaf actors, we're teaching the hearing actors basic sign language, mother, father, family, and so on. We learned all of these. We had interpreters there as well. The stage manager was involved, the assistant manager, everyone was involved, and it was beautiful. And by about a month in, everyone was signing with each other. We had less and less use of the interpreters, but they were there if we needed them. 
sometimes some in-depth philosophical conversations. We wanted the interpreters, but <laughs> my experience it just impacted me so much. It was really wonderful. Am I still on track? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> For OSF, um, I had a role um, of ASL translator, meaning I was reading the Shakespeare, rewriting it in a notation style for ASL. We call it glossing, G-L-O-S-S. Um, but I was really working with the linguistic process, thinking about what does this mean? What is the dramaturgic history? What does it mean? How does it, and how will it fit in sign language? So that was a lot of work. That was a huge job for me. Um, OSF, their view, they thought, oh, sure, one person, one deaf person, yeah. we can do that, one deaf actor, no big deal. A couple of hearing folks, you know, act, you know, that this was a doable job. The deaf actor was hired as um, King Cymbeline. Um, so that's an important role, and they hired me to be included with that. And I begged, I said, please, 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 I need two weeks prior to the rehearsal. I know their schedule. <laughs> um, and the director gave me one week. So one week, so he was, he was stuck in jury duty, poor guy. So we had, we lost a week of the time, but I had a week to start working on it, so thank goodness for that. I had a week to prep. I sat down with the director and the dramaturg, myself, the deaf actor, and another actor who was acting as interpreter. And all of us, this whole group sat down, we looked at the language, we, looked, we talked about the meaning, we talked about how should this be interpreted, how should this be signed, uh, are there different ways to sign it, um, hierarchy, how are we gonna sign that word, hierarchy, it's related to power. Um, and, when would we sign that? When would it be spoken? Um, should the soldiers sign the play? He's the king, and the soldiers should know to sign, right? So I had a big job to figure out, you know, the role of each of the characters in the play as well, not just doing the language. So there was a lot of logistics and teaching the soldier to sign as well. And then the person playing the queen, the wife, she never signed. So that showed a different power imbalance. So that was really cool. How are we gonna show that? And we really thought through that culturally. And that was, you know, all this cultural information that I had to impart as well. And then the director thought, you know, we wanna use this part, we wanna show the power this way, we wanna be more vague on this part. So we really brainstormed together. And it was really nice. And then the deaf, deaf actor was included in that as well with their opinions, you know, the two of us, Myself as a deaf person and the actor, sometimes we disagreed, but you know, it's like you know, all women are not going to have the same opinion. All deaf people are not going to have the same opinion. So you know, we did come, we agreed to disagree on some things, but that really helped us to sit down and look at, you know, what is what should this look like, this play? And I'm not saying it was perfect. It's important that the direct that we had a dialogue beforehand, a conversation. And then, you know, the future, you know, different people in the future did not have that same experience at OSF. Other deaf actors are not having the same experience, and that's frustrating to me. Sometimes the actors have no sign experience because then they're going to, they have people coming in who are going to interpret for the deaf actors. And I feel really bad for the hearing actors. I'm like, oh my God, this language is different. What do I do? What do I do? It's like, settle down, everyone. <laughs> You know, sometimes we just don't have time. We don't have the luxury of time in that type of situation. So I begged and I begged before the directors, please schedule an ASL meeting. <laughs> you know, it's hard. You know, we're trying to do that at the same time with the understudy. And so we had to think about timing, how do we schedule, we have to ask for extra time, special time. Thirdly, a uh, theater company in Berkshire Theater Company in Massachusetts. We had a rehearsal for Children of a Lesser God. They asked me to be the ASL director for the sign language. Let me back up, sorry, sorry, sorry. 
there's a sign coach different than artistic sign language director. Do you know what I'm talking about, the difference? Let me explain. When we have a sign coach, we watch the person who is learning the sign language, and we make sure that they're signing clearly. That's it. That's all we're doing. The DASL, Director of American Sign Language, uh, for OSF, I worked as a DASL. And I worked with the dramaturg, and worked with the deaf community, worked with the translators. We all worked together. So that's a fair job. So that's the DASL. When we're talking about, do we want to do American Sign Language? Do we want to do Sign Exact English? Do we want to do Pigeon Sign Language? Do we want to do Regional, International Sign Language, French? You know, I know French Sign Language myself as well. And now I'm learning uh, Korean Sign Language and a few others. But these are all things that are important to know what to do and what the role is. If the Berkshire Company asked me to be their dazzle. <laughs> And, I, and OSF has me as well. And so I asked them, what do you need? Or they asked me, what do I need? And I said, you know, I need some guidelines. You know, how do you work with deaf people? How do you work with deaf actors? I typed up a bunch of stuff for them. I thought, oh, I can tell you how to work with deaf actors. I had four pages. I sent that off, four pages, you know. <laughs> it wasn't done, but I sent it. But how to work with these folks, you know, eye contact. Look at people in the eye. Gesture. Hello. Get their attention. You know, <laughs> like you can't not look at the person. You need to look at the person. If the interpreter is voicing my hello, you know, they'll look at me. You know, oh yes. You know, response. You know, follow. It's been the person's nodding their heads. I know that they've seen me. You know, these are ways to work together. How to set up the interpreters? What's the actual logistic of the interpreters? We have interpreters here in the front row. We have interpreters standing up front. You know, these people can see me signing. The other interpreters. You know, these are logistical things we have to. Um, and we also have to talk about rhythm of sign language. When people are reading like this, <laughs> the deaf person can't do that. We got to look at the paper and we got to sign. And we got to read it again and then we got to sign. And people are like, okay, this is taking forever. <laughs> Or we maybe do something like this, one-handed signing. <laughs> you know, give us a podium, give us some music stand, something. So these are things I try to encourage deaf actors to get off book sooner so they're not doing these kind of things. So we talk about, you know, study your lines, get off book as soon as possible. You want your hands free. So I've noticed in my experience, hearing culture and deaf culture are different. In deaf culture, there's a lot of expansion and explaining, storytelling of a situation. This is how, this is so in your mind, you can get, you know, talk about the hierarchy of a family or political power, who's above and below, and, and how, what are the relationships, you know, what's behind all of, well, what's the drama behind all of these things? So uh, we have a lot of storytelling about this in sign language. And so if that's not clear, oh, you're supposed to be my sister. Oh, okay, okay, great, my sister. You know, these kind of things are important to explain. And again, we don't have enough training, enough trained deaf actors. So we need to give a little more time to those deaf actors. Um. Reagan, I'm going to pass it off to you to talk about um, rehearsals and tech and performances. But before I do, I wanted to check in with our survey and see what some other people in the country say that they need. Again, stop me if this costs money. Um, uh, <laughs> Mickey Rowe needs an audio recording of the script or the first reading. That helps him learn his lines. Easy to do if you know in advance. Anita Hollander needs cushions on hard chairs and access to an elevator. Again, pretty, uh, pretty easy to figure out if you're committed to having an accessible rehearsal space, which doesn't have to be your regular rehearsal space. If you're working with a performer with a disability that needs something that your building doesn't provide, you can get creative about what building you're rehearsing in. Um, 
Great, again, Megan Bailey says I need really clear instructions with some additional support. Um, again, all of these things are pretty easy to think about. Um, I really liked the idea of, um, of performers that say, you know what, if I have a recording, either a video recording or an audio recording, what happens, then I can go home and do my own homework and I can do all of the same work that an actor without accommodation would do. This is just an extra tool to help me do it. So that's really helpful for me. Um, right, I need housing on the ground floor and I need transportation to get to rehearsal. Feels pretty um, easy to do. Reagan, I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, the accommodations that you need in rehearsal and then, all, and then we'll jump over to family and see what additional accommodations they have for particularly uh, tech and performances. Well, personally, when I've been in a rehearsal process or performance, um, Largely, my biggest concern is bathroom time. <laughs> because if they call five minutes for a break and I have to go out of the bath, you know, into a hall and then take the elevator upstairs and then my, my bathroom process just takes a little bit longer. And then, you know, like that is honestly my biggest concern <laughs> in, in a rehearsal process. Um, and then of course, you know, just being able to navigate um, the, the space. I do, I have similar with my hands. I'm often using my hands to move myself so I can't move and look at my script at the same time. So those are things that I've developed my own strategies for um, how do I make sure that my script isn't constantly falling off my lap, things like that. Um, but really, you know, there's, there's, not, there's not a lot that personally I require for a rehearsal process. Um, and, and yeah, you can so, oh, pop those up there. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about accessible technology and then we'll pass it off to Monique to talk a little bit about visual cues. Yes, so accessible technology, um, really, you know, it's just thinking of the ways in which technology can now be helpful in terms of access. We do have uh, actors in family who have traumatic brain injuries. So when they're getting their notes from, from a director, they need to record or they need to write those down immediately. Um, so while in family we have a no cell phone policy in the rehearsal room we do allow cell phones for technology purposes for access purposes um, also accessible technology one thing that we've started to utilize with our deaf actors um, or hard of hearing actors um, is an earpiece that is essentially like a monitor an in-ear monitor that they can use during our musical performances so that they get they can they can hear the music because sometimes they can't hear it in the actual space with the acoustics Um, in performances about visual cues and how those work. I think this is a really exciting opportunity to artistically um, to think about the vocabulary that you use when you're telling a story because when you're committed to those accommodations you actually have a new language at your disposal to use while you're telling that story. So I just wanted Monique to talk a little bit about um, visual cues. Certainly. With Huntington Theater Company in Boston we did set up, we decided how to use the, uh, what do we call it? We hired a stage manager slash facilitator. And this person would help with hearing. If there were any problems going on, technically they would come up and sign and let us know what was happening, which was very nice. We also had lights set up in place so that we could see each other. This is really cool. So while on stage, we had a glass booth set up the stage manager booth that had a reflection. So we could see the other actors on the other side of the stage through the reflection on the stage booth and we could adjust our positioning accordingly. And sometimes they would set up three different monitors for music, oftentimes there'll be monitors set up and we can see those. So there was up high and I could see the monitor and I'd have enough time to move and leave the stage. And I know with a small budget, uh, the theater group we used uh, regular FaceTime. We use FaceTime. So we'd have it set up on an iPad and we could look and then we could then, and you know, you have to be creative with what you've got. And we could use that as a tool to, to coordinate the stage. And sometimes even just a flashlight, flashing a light off stage, we would use that as a way to cue. And again, you get creative, you think out of the box. And you've got the resources there that can help you accomplish these things.
So for tech and performances, we had some um, uh, designers from the disability community that said, you know what, I need an accessible tech table and I need stage walkers to do notes for me because it's, it's helpful for me to stay in one spot. That's usually easy to find. Um, I need to make sure that the dressing room is on stage level and that the backstage is clear of any debris. And you know what, um, I know that this has happened at Actors Theater and other theaters as well. Even if you don't have dressing rooms on stage level, you can make a dressing room on stage level. You want to communicate that in advance so the actor knows what they're rolling into, but it's totally possible to make that happen just because it doesn't isn't necessarily designated as a dressing room. Um, what else? Individual dressing space. Oh, Reagan, will you tell your quick story about flow? This is a really good one. Sure. All right. So this was um, something that came up at OSF. So the dressing rooms are not on the same level as the stage in the Bulmer at OSF. Um, and there's one elevator that's also a very s slow elevator <laughs> that goes from the dressing room level to the stage level. And that elevator was often being used by the costume crew at the same time. Um, so it was just a matter of figuring out what our flow was going to be between me needing to use it and the costume, the costumers needing to use it to transport costumes. And you know, after like a couple performances, we knew I knew exactly how much time I needed to plan to get up and get on stage, as opposed to like when they were going to be, you know, changing somebody in that elevator. So just thinking about like those those little pieces of. And then one time our flow was disrupted because the elevator was broken and then the stagehands just carried me up the stairs. So it's all about flexibility. I don't know about you, but the awesome stage management teams that I've had the privilege to work with would love these challenges. They'd be like, bring it on and we can make this happen, right? You get a good stage manager on it and you're good to go. So again, there's, it's really fun. When you say we're gonna do this, we commit to it, it's actually really fun to figure out. Okay. Um, so, I asked our, um, our survey participants what they wanted people in this room to know. What they wanted casting directors and company managers, directors, producers to know about accessibility. And here's what they said. They said, um, <laughs> I love this, listen and say thank you when you're being told about a reasonable accommodation. And Mickey was like, even if you don't know how to do it and you're kind of worried about it, just say thanks. And then you can go back with, here's what I figured out, here's what can work, here's what can't, rather than having that moment with them. Just be like, thank you. Always good to know. Um, I like this one. Don't be afraid to ask me questions, right? Um, I'll ask for what I need, but I don't know your space super well. So that goes back to, we are the experts on our own space, and we're really good at being hosts. And our guests will know what they need. Um, I like this one. Don't plan an accommodation for me without me. That's... Uh, it's just good customer service, but I think it helps us from um, using our time wisely, too. Um, I know I can get caught in that trap as a teacher and as an access provider. I'm like, oh, I know, and I never know. I just need to ask. Um, great. Also, this one, communicate, be welcoming, and be open to change. Um, I know one of the things that Reagan and I talked about when we were planning for this session is if you're doing it right, it's really messy, and you're figuring it out as you go and you can give a long list of things that didn't work before you get to what did, but it's about kind of committing to that process. Um, oh, I liked this one. Brianka said, accommodations ensure that performers do their best work. It helps everybody when they're provided without a hassle, right? So if the goal is to make an accessible process where everyone feels comfortable doing their best work, then finding a way to provide that accommodation is gonna be a win-win. Um, and with that, um, did Reagan or Monique have any other final thoughts to add before we ask for questions from the group? No? Okay, great. So we'll go ahead with questions. I know um, that some of you might have some specific projects in mind, or you might have some um, organizational specific questions about potential um, inaccessible moments or things that feel like they are potentially inaccessible and we have not just with a panel but also in the room some really smart creative people that might have um, an opportunity to do this I want I want us to end the session being really um, excited and empowered so if we can kind of uh, find that job I'm happy to Do we have a question or anything we can help with Ooh, yeah okay oh, are we ready, are we ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Kitty. Oh. 
Uh, and I am a disabled actor. And uh, I am able to pass as abled in most situations. Um, a lot of directors, when I'm auditioning, just they can't tell and I'll bring it up in rehearsals. And uh, it's a problem because I'm not able to bring up my accommodations before the process even starts uh, because I have been not cast in things because people didn't know what to do with me. Uh, so I was wondering, my question is, uh, what is your experience working with people who are uh, disabled but otherwise invisible or after be having come out as disabled, um, uh, uh, removing the invisibility? And strategies, I guess, coping strategies. Thank you. So this is a really interesting question because, um, you know, like for me, uh, the I don't. I can't really pass. <laughs> um, however, it does come up with, for instance, um, headshots and resumes. And do I put that I'm a wheelchair user on my resume? Do I have a, my headshot just my head like everybody else does, or do I have to include my wheelchair so that you know? Um, so my my own opinion. I think you do your best work when you're being your truest self, and when you're not um, when you're not misrepresenting what and, and and there's no judgment that comes with that misrepresentation because I understand why people do it because you want to get the job um, but I really believe that at least my experience has been the more you embody the truth of who you are the more people are actually going to be interested in that truth and in you as a performer um, so I think it, it, it plays out individually in in you know I think especially in terms of the accommodations, if there's something that you know you cannot go through the process without needing, um, I think it is best to talk about that up front as early as possible. Does that mean that somebody might, you know, it might cost you the job? Yes, and that's a shitty situation that I just hope is gonna change um, as theaters become more inclusive. Um, but I think ultimately we don't start to make change if we're not letting theaters know that like this is a process that they should be engaging in and asking about those accommodations up front. And so I think you're a change maker if you're able to do that. Um, yeah, does that kind of help answer? Did I get it? You're <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I'm also wondering if you've had experience having to remove the invisibility for uh, either mm -hmm. working with family theater or how do you yes yeah. yes and I think with family it's interesting because we do have people with visible and invisible disabilities um, it's amazing I think the experience of working with family empowers a lot of people who may have an invisible disability to start actively you know communicating about their disability I think there's so much shame and so much um, uh, marginalization that comes along with that identity and that's a whole other session I mean talking about like how we start to make disability interesting and sexy and attractive as opposed to something that people don't want to deal with and don't want to look at and don't want to pay attention to and that's what I think in terms of theory of disability we have so much untapped resource in, in disability in terms of how it plays out in theatrical um, spaces and stories um, but I think for the most part, I think it's it, it, one thing I believe in is finding that community and 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 being able to inhabit that identity, whatever that looks like for you. Um, and and I don't think that that's easy without support. And I think that's one of the most amazing things about family is that the transformation that occurs for people that come to family, not only theatrically and artistically, but also just the human transformation of actually finally being able to identify as something when you've been told your entire life that that is something you don't want to be part of. And I had that experience. As visible as my disability is, after my injury, I was like, no, I have a spinal cord injury. I'm not part of the disabled community. Like, I don't want to be, you know, that's something that, that's about congenital situations. And, you know, and, and through working with this amazing group of people, you realize, oh, we're just all on the same human spectrum. Some of us fake it a little better than others, but like, we're all fucked up. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, ultimately that, that's my goal, is, is to hopefully get to a point where, 
you know, in a weird way, family wouldn't necessarily exist for the reasons that it was formed to exist because we'd, um, it wouldn't be this binary of, of able and disabled. It would just be, we're all somewhere on that spectrum and all of our theaters are working to accommodate anybody at any point on that spectrum. Um, so if you want to come hang out with family too, because maybe that'll help. We'll go here and then in the back. Uh, yeah. uh, well. So I was, I noticed when you were listing resources that you listed um, SAG and AFTRA, but equity wasn't, what is this, what is the, um, and I'm not, you know, whatever, I'm just asking, are you finding, is there a movement amongst actors equity, is, are there people that are speaking out and raising awareness and are you getting support from your union, I guess mm -hmm. is my question. Yes, equity has people with disabilities, PWD, it's under them, and we continue to discuss that. Yes, they often will send out information and tips and auditions and all of that kind of stuff. Yes, there are others. I will just say though, it's a very slow, difficult process with equity. Um, you know, still there are many equity auditions where I go and they're not accessible and, um, you know, it, it, it's felt like a little bit of an ebb and flow for many, many years and I think if you talk to actors with disabilities who have been in the game for a long time, it's like, yeah, there's this big push and they'll form IMPWD and then three years later it's like there's nothing happening with it. Um, so I, I'm interested in figuring out how we can create that longevity in terms of this interest, and I think that actually starts more at an individual theater level in terms of the work that's being done. Is it okay if I speak to that? Yeah, and then we'll go back. Yeah. Um, just as a, a hearing theater producer uh, who recently wrote a special appearance equity contract, you missed Dan, sorry, I don't know. Um, I was appalled uh, that, uh, for a deaf actor, um, was appalled that equity sent me continually very strongly worded reminders that that actor was never supposed to start any work at all until that contract was signed, but paid no mind at all, nor did they care if I was providing her with ASL interpreters in rehearsal. Um, they didn't follow up with that, and, um, and I wrote them a very strongly worded letter and heard nothing back. Um, so I find, I find that to be, um, like, I find that to be a problem. So I, I, you know, there's something that we can be doing advocacy. It's that it's insisting that that they take that equity take more care of their membership. So, yep. I am Sorry. Joe. <laughs> I have one more really quick interesting thing to mention. Um, so some of our actors are on fixed incomes because of disability assistance, and we have one particular actor who has was equity and ended up having to stop being equity because she couldn't pay her dues. And um, and her work with family, there was somebody who had called her out and said, oh, well, she's working with you know family and say she's an equity actor, she's not paying her dues. And, and yet family was the only place she, she could work or that she felt um, available to work. So it was just a very, and, and equity ended up giving her like permission to work with family and you know consider herself equity and not pay um, the dues as regularly as, as she would otherwise have been expected um, because it was a very you know it was it was there was no availability to her to um, make the money she needed to pay her dues so that was an accommodation that equity did make. So I know we have a question, we'll head to the back of the room, but I just want to say what I'm hearing in this room is that we have a lot of power and that we, as, as theater makers and as companies, we can demand what we need and what we want to see on our stages. And the more we learn about the accommodations that we need, we can let equity know, here's how you can help us out. So that's something that we can do in terms of moving forward, because um, we have a lot of resources in this room just with the people sitting here. Um, moving that way, but I know we had a question towards the back. Thank you. Oh, who? You. Sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Brian Weaver. Brian Weaver from Portland Playhouse, and it's a question for Monique. Um, I'm curious. 
about uh, when you've been cast in plays, um, some uh, some of the creative solutions that you and directors have used when, um, when you are playing a actor, maybe you're playing a a, um, a hearing actor, it, uh, and do, are there interpreters on stage, or or have other do other uh, hearing actors speak lines as you're signing them to, or, or or voiceovers or super titles or maybe all those things? I'm just be, I'm curious to hear some of the creative ways that you've been cast, um, and yeah. Okay, great, great question. That's a good question. <laughs> well, I was cast for King Lear as Cordelia at the DC Shakespeare Fest, uh, Company. I was the only person who signed. And we had that conversation with the director. <laughs> the Fool and I would be together. We uh, coordinated those roles. And the background of the story is that he was the one who raised me because my, the king was too busy to raise me. So maybe the fool and I would create our own homemade sign, which would make sense logically. Because there was already a formally structured sign language, but it was just me and the, and the fool together. And so the problem was that the actor who played the fool wasn't comfortable. Not, it wasn't, he's not a, that person wasn't a physical, uh, physical theater actor, more of a language actor, which was fine. So what happened is that that person would voice what I signed, and that was a compromise that we came up with in the situation. And then with other actors, things came up like Duke of Burgundy and King of France. They were flirting, and Cordes wanted to marry that person, and finally. The king of France said, okay, I will marry them because the duke doesn't want to. And we discussed how to show that that person really cared for Cordelia during that courtship. It wasn't fluent, but willing, like that person was willing to learn, to learn Cordelia's language. And then the audience was like, oh, really teach them. It's a love story. And it was more impactful because of that. And so we got creative and really tried to find ways to make that story more human and connecting. And that's how we have that dialogue and collaboration. We work together to make that happen. If there's a barrier, we can find a way around it. Hey, can I say something? So a big part of this session has been more about nuts and bolts logistics, um, and we, we haven't talked as much about the artistic incorporation of disability. But there's just one thing that I do want to say, because this came up yesterday um, in a diversity session or about EDI, uh, is this idea of like authorial intent. And well, if it wasn't intended to be a person who uses a wheelchair, if it wasn't intended to be a deaf person, if that wasn't explicit, then are we doing the service? And and I have to think of like, well, why do we consider a disability such an aberrant characteristic that stands out as opposed to somebody's hair color or somebody's body size? Like we're we're fine casting, you know, um, I don't know, King Lear. You know, we're fine casting King Lear, uh, and and not every King Lear looks the same um, ever. And but if we but if all of a sudden we throw a wheelchair into a mix or a limp into a mix or you know. Why is that so much different? Why do we assume that that person is going to have a completely different life experience that doesn't connect to the experience of King Lear, um, as opposed to just having less hair as King Lear? You know, so it's just something that I challenge people to think about because I often think that in casting, you know, it's like, well, if it doesn't call for a disability, then how do we fit that in? And it's like, you know what? People with disabilities are still just human beings. You know, they may mobilize a little bit differently. Their minds may work a little differently. But it's no different from any other human characteristic we're considering in casting. Claudia, back. We're at about five minutes, so we're, we're great. I just wanted to let us know where we were. Uh, so, I, I, I 
have a two-parter question, so I hope it's not too large and long. Uh, one question is, I hadn't heard, or at least I don't recall hearing in this conversation, any discussion of crip face or disability drag or whatever language we like to use to talk about that practice, but I did want to make sure we said that out loud in this room and request of my fellow theater makers, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> and the second question is this. So I wrote in a, or, or I produced a, um, I created a, a collection of plays, and one of the roles was identity specific, and it said in the script, this role must be cast by a person of color who has a physical disability. We kept it vague. It, we thought we were open enough, and then my discovery was that particular play ended up not getting produced in a lot of communities. So the disability story was not told, but it was because the theater makers wanted to be, um, uh, they, 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 they didn't want to do disability drag. So I respected that, and yet it was a gigantic loss. And I discovered everybody calling me, asking me where the black, disabled, uh, physically disabled actors were, and that was a deep frustration. And I'm just wondering, in those wonderful resources you shared, um, um, are, are people of color involved in those resources? If, if I reach out to them, am I gonna find the black actors? Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you for bringing up the concept of crip face. Um, and just in case you guys are not aware of what that is, it's similar to black face, yellow face, but it's, it's you know, cultural appropriation of disability culture and casting. Um, so again, I think that goes more to the artistic, theoretical stuff that we're not covering as much, but thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Um, and um, I guess in terms of that, so I think often when you're talking about disability, actors with disabilities, there are two different ways in which you're you're encountering it. Either you have something that is very specific. There's somebody, you know, there's a role that is looking for somebody who uses a wheelchair, um, or you're talking about this this other spectrum of just humanity, and you have a role that doesn't specify anything, and thinking about casting a person with a disability in that role, even though it's not specified. Um, it's very. I think it's really complicated when you are looking for something that's very specific. There was one example I know of recently where it was a person of color who uses a wheelchair, and, and I heard this said that it felt like they were looking for a unicorn. And I was like, give me a break, people. Like, there are, there are people with disabilities who are people of color as well, like, all over the place. Now, I think what you may have to, you know, modify your thinking is, again, thinking about those, like, colonial models and what are we looking for when we're looking for a certain kind of authenticity? What are we looking for when we're looking for artistic quality? Yeah, that may be something that you have to modify because you're looking, you want to find this person with this particular identity. Um, so to your question, you know, I, I honestly, I don't think we have actors um, with disabilities who are also actors of color. I think we need to do a better job of training those individuals, of identifying those, of bringing those people into the mix. Um, it, they do exist. They exist in family, they exist in other places, but I think that is one area that when we're talking about disability, it tends to be white-centric um, in terms of those who are out there doing the work. But it's not, that's not 100%. So, um, yeah, I guess that's what I have to say. So to wrap up, I think this is a brilliant question to wrap up with, because I think when you are planning ahead and when you make a commitment to produce a play that has a very specific need in that way, that is currently in our social structure very specific, I think you need to plan ahead for some resources and say, I might not find this performer in my immediate local community, but I have set aside resources to broaden my search. I also think that we need to, before we shut down and say we are not doing a play because we can't find X or Y, we need to realize that the conversation is not yes or no. There's a ton of gray area in between. And if we are open and communicative to what's going on, I know um, theater performers in the Washington DC area that say, you know what? I prefer that a certain role is played by a person with a disability, but 
if a director calls me and says they're willing to swap it out and cast a performer with a disability in a non-disabled role, then I'm willing to have that role that's written for a disability played by a non-disabled actor because then the equity is still there. You're still having the, dis the lived disability experience in the room. You're just playing a little bit more with how that's represented on stage. So I don't want us to get too caught up in a binary of yes and no because access, the fun part of access lives in all of that gray area. So I, I think the biggest thing I want you to take away from this session is that it's possible. It might not look like you think it will on the offset and if it does, I'm a little concerned. But just go on, but just say yes and go on that journey if that makes sense. So I think that's where I want to leave us today. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Reagan. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Claudia, for participating. And here are yeah. these oh, yeah, and here are some handouts on your way out.